webinar. Uh, today's topic is scaling MongoDB best practices for sharding, indexing, and performance isolation. Before we get started, few housekeeping stuff. Um, uh, this tech talk is going to be recorded and it will be made available after the event. All participants will be muted for the duration of the talk. So if you have any questions, please uh, send them through the Q&A section of the webinar tool. Uh, we will answer them at the end. And we, we are also available on the Slack channel uh, listed here, which is bit.ly slash rockset hyphen community hyphen chat channel. This is a public uh, Slack channel for Rockset community. So you can join there and ask any questions that you have related to MongoDB or Rockset. So cool, let's get started. Uh, first, a brief introduction uh, about myself. Um, I'm Prakash Chakalingam. I'm a, a director of product at Rockset. Before Rockset, I was with uh, Databricks. I was product manager there, um, managing Delta Lake open source project. And before that, I was with companies like Netflix and Yahoo managing their data infrastructure there. And I also have with me Dai. Uh, Dai, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. <clears throat> My name is Dai. Uh, I'm a site reliability engineer here at Rockset. Um, I've been with the company for just over three years. I uh, got to touch you know, pretty much all parts of the infrastructure here. Um, prior to that, uh, I worked as a site reliability engineer at Foursquare for about four years. Um, I spent much of that time uh, working on various MongoDB projects, of which I'll reference a few during this talk. Um, and most of the content of this talk is from stuff that I learned during that period. Um, prior to that, I was uh, an IT engineer on the uh, BI infrastructure team at uh, Target headquarters in Minneapolis. Um, and yeah, with that, um, I'll uh, give it back to Prakash to go over uh, you know, some of the agenda that we're, we'll be talking about. Oh, Jai, uh, can you actually move to the agenda? Yep. agenda. So for the agenda, we have uh, um, two, main, uh, two sections. The first one is all about scaling strategies for Mongo, which is the core topic of uh, uh, discussion today. So um, as like companies are adopting Mongo, building an app with Mongo, there are two sets of problems typically uh, companies face. The first one comes purely from scaling, which is your app is becoming popular, so which means more and more users are coming to your app application, which is a good problem to have, uh, but you need to now think about scaling Mongo as more and more uh, requests hit Mongo. So that is the first class of problem. The second class of problem is as the app gets popular, you also want to build more and more features for this application, more and more engaging features, which would require uh, actually going beyond just key value lookups, right? Like there'll be a lot of features that would require some aggregations, more than uh, sometimes aggregations. Uh, so, uh, so these are the two common sets of problems uh, that uh, customers or organizations face when they actually uh, start uh, using Mongo. So, uh, um, Dai will go over some of the scaling strategies that he used at Foursquare at massive scale to get, get this working. So we'll go over sharding, cluster balancing, indexing, and performance isolation as a four major topics and give best practices on what to use uh, and when to use them and what are the common pitfalls. And for the second section, uh, I'll go over some of the external indexing that uh, companies use today. So there are a lot of cases where uh, companies or uh, users build uh, their external index with Elasticsearch or with other systems. So I'll talk about how that architecture looks like and how you can do that with Rockset and what are the benefits of doing it with Rockset and, uh, and how you can leverage Rockset to change your architecture and scale well. So, and then finally, we have, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So I'll first pass the baton to uh, Dai to go over the scaling strategies for Mongo. All right, thanks Prakash. Um, so the first uh, topic we'll talk about is sharding. Um, you all are probably somewhat familiar with sharding, um, but I'll just go over some of the basics and uh, some of the things to watch out for when um, you know deciding how to shard and picking a shard key and things like that. <clears throat> so just the basics: what is sharding and why do you need it? Um, basically, uh, you know, as your data set continues to grow, 
uh, eventually it will no longer fit on a single machine. Uh, even if you continue to make that machine bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, you can only make it so big. So at some point you're gonna have to split it across more than one. Um, and so that's what sharding is, is just distributing your data across multiple machines. Um, you may also reach a point where you need to shard uh, before you max out a, a single machine's um, you know, data size or data capacity. And that's when, you know, uh, because only a single primary can take writes. Uh, so if you only have one replica set, you know, a single machine is taking all of the writes. And if you have a workload that is uh, very write heavy, you might, you know, be maxing out the, the CPU on that machine um, or the memory on that machine uh, before, you know, maxing out the, the data capacity and then you'll have to shard as well. And so you can um, get multiple primaries and multiple shards to distribute some of that write load. Um, and so the, what, what the, you know, key thing to think about uh, when deciding to shard is what you're going to pick for the shard key. So the shard key is important because it determines how your documents in your collections are distributed across the shards. Um, you know, the value of the shard key basically will determine where that, uh, which shard that document lives. Um, the shard key has to consist of one or more fields that exist in every single document uh, because without the, the shard key, the um, cluster will not know where, uh, which shard to put that document on. And the last thing is critical, um, MongoDB does not support changing the shard key once you've sharded a collection. So it's very critical that you make the right decision at the beginning um, and uh, not have to be in a situation where you um, are kind of forced to change the shard key. Uh, it is possible to do, but I won't go into the details of you know how. Um, we've had to do it uh, actually a couple of times at Foursquare because we made poor decisions, which I will talk about uh, later on in the talk. Um, and it's a very complex process to do um, because it's not supported by Mongo out of the box. So uh, basically you just wanna avoid having to do that uh, at all. <clears throat> So some things to think about when choosing a shard key um, is that the, the best shard key is the one that allows for the most just uh, even distribution of your data and load. Uh, it is possible to run into a situation where uh, even if your data is distributed evenly, uh, the load may not be and vice versa. Um, and the second thing is uh, if you can choose uh, your shard key in such a way that it um, can satisfy uh, a lot of queries that you're going to be running uh, as well, then you can get a bonus there for not having to incur the cost of adding an index purely for the shard key. Um, so the first and probably most important thing to think about when choosing your shard key is uh, whether it's going to be a range shard key or a hash shard key. Um, before I talk about the differences, I um, want to introduce uh, the concept of what a chunk is in MongoDB. And that is basically uh, when you shard a collection, Mongo will split uh, the, the documents in the collection into various chunks. And a chunk is basically a single contiguous range of shard key values. And uh, one chunk can only ever belong to one shard. And so, um, you know, if you have a chunk that ends up in a situation that cannot be um, cut down anymore and it still has like a million documents in it, uh, you may run into an unbalanced uh, situation because that chunk can only ever live on a single shard. Um, so the difference between a ranged uh, and a hash shard key is that for ranged, um, the, the values basically are just the raw values in the field uh, that you have chosen to be your shard key or a set of fields. Uh, and the um, each chunk is just a contiguous range in, inside of there. And this might be useful if you wanna you know, run queries like uh, range queries across the field that is being indexed by the, the shard key index. Um, the hashed uh, shard key is exactly like it sounds. Um, instead of using the raw shard key value that you've uh, chosen, it puts it through a hash function instead and uses that to determine which, uh, which chunk the document will live in. Um, and this is useful uh, if you don't need to run range queries, it will um, most often result in more even balancing because it's totally random. Um, and so my personal uh, recommendation is that, you know, if you don't need to use ranged uh, range queries, basically always go with the hashed uh, shard key. Um, there's like some uh, 
you know, edge cases, but I won't really go into those. The general rule is that um, I would recommend a hash shard key uh, in almost all cases if you don't need to use range queries. Um, <clears throat> with, with the hash function, if you do issue range queries because um, it has to put the shard key value through a hash function, then um, the query has to be broadcast to every single shard uh, all the time. So that's the downside. Um, the other thing to consider here, um, the next most important thing I would probably say is the cardinality of the shard key, which is basically the total possible number of uh, unique shard key values. Uh, and this is important because it determines the maximum number of chunks that you can have in your collection, which then also determines the maximum possible shards that you can have in your collection. Uh, and so if you choose a shard key that has low cardinality, then you may not be able to scale out very far. Um, so always aim for high cardinality here. <clears throat> the next thing is to consider frequency, and that is how often documents have a particular shard key value. Um, and if you choose a shard key value that um, has unbalanced frequency, it may uh, cause bottlenecks down the line and potentially in unsplittable chunks. Um, you know, one example might be if you have a collection of people's names, uh, if you choose like the last name to be the shard key value, then, you know, some last names are much more popular than others. And so, you know, those values will, will um, result in, you know, if you have uh, most of your data set has one particular last name, then um, all of those documents that have that last name will go to a single chunk. And if that becomes too big, then it cannot be split any further. Uh, once it's down to a single value, and then uh, that chunk may may be so big that you cannot even move it from one shard to another. <clears throat> so you don't want to end up in that situation. And the last thing is to consider the rate of change, which is how the shard key value will change over time. Um, typically, the thing to avoid here is uh, monotonically increasing or decreasing shard keys. So things like a user ID that is often just increasing, um, you know, monotonically over time. Uh, you want to avoid using that because it will cause all of your inserts to go into a single chunk. So there's uh, the, right there, you lose the benefit of sharding completely as ter um, in terms of write load. Uh, and um, another uh, more kind of nuanced thing that can happen is if you use a TTL index on this collection, uh, in addition to a monotonically increasing or decreasing shard key, uh, it will over time create a trail of empty chunks. Um, and so all of the data in your collection will only live in the most recent um, set of chunks. And as the TTL index deletes documents over time, um, all of the, the older chunks will just uh, be totally empty. <clears throat> and um, the, the way to avoid this, if you do want to use uh, yeah, a monotonically increasing or decreasing shard key, if again, you don't need to use range queries, then I would recommend that you just use the hashed um, version of that field, and that will mitigate both of these issues. Um, just to go over what we talked about in a couple of examples, um, a example of a bad shard key, which we actually um, used in a couple of collections at Foursquare from the beginning, probably because um, we thought we would never run into a situation where uh, we need to scale out that far, is like the first one is timestamp mod 1000. Um, this is uh, bad because the cardinality is only 1000. And so what ended up happening was um, over time in this collection, it, it was, it grew to like, you know, over a billion documents and we only had a thousand possible values for the shard key. And so we had um, exactly 1000 chunks over time. And each one of those chunks was so large that uh, Mongo refused to move it from one shard to another. So when we had to add new shards to this cluster uh, to try and scale out um, the new shards, didn't get any data because it refused to move any of the chunks over to them. So actually scaling out the number of shards wasn't helping us there. So this was actually one case where we had to uh, rewrite the shard key. Um, <clears throat> the next example is just like your raw user ID, like I mentioned before. Um, so not only will this result in all of your uh, inserts to go to a single chunk, which means it'll go to a single shard, um, you may uh, have cases where um, the, the load in your application or the behavior of users in your application are such that um, you know, some ranges of user ID have more load than others. And this was the case at Foursquare as well. We found that 
uh, people who came into the application more recently, so newer users, uh, checked in more frequently. And so they generated more inserts, more documents uh, than previous users who may have cycled out of the application and no longer use it or whatever. And so uh, the shard that had the um, latest set of chunks of user ID, basically we, not, we found not only were they hot because uh, of the insert load, but also because of the read load, because they, they, uh, those users were more active. Um, so to mitigate um, both of these things, uh, an example of a good uh, shard key would be a hashed user ID. Um, in this case, it would avoid all of the problems that I had discussed before. <clears throat> cool. Um, the next topic, uh, we'll go over just some brief, um, you know, what the topology kind of looks like in a sharded configuration. Um, just to introduce some of the examples that I'll need to talk about later. So if your cluster is not sharded at all, um, you'll only be running a single replica set, which is one of these green boxes down below. Uh, when you shard your cluster, you're going to need to introduce a few more pieces of infrastructure. Um, and those are the router, which is the Mongo S, and the config servers, uh, which is another replica set. Um, but they're kind of special. So they hold the metadata um, of all of the chunks of and which shards they belong to in your collection and your cluster. And then the router uh, will, when they receive a query, your, your app um, will no longer directly talk directly to the replica set. It will instead talk to the router, which is the Mongo S. And um, Mongo S will look at that query and query the config servers for the metadata of chunks and determine which shard to send that query to, uh, and maybe more than one. And then it will get the results from all of those uh, uh, shards and then um, combine them together and pass it back to the app server. OK, so now that we've uh, you know decided to shard our cluster, um, your cluster is growing over time, uh, you need to scale out. Uh, how do we ensure that the cluster continues to be balanced even as you know data continues to change um, and grow over time? Um, the main concept here is the Mongo provides you an auto balancer. Uh, and the uh, main job of this auto balancer is to distribute uh, the number of chunks evenly across all of the shards. And you can set various thresholds um, and you know you can even set when you want it to run or not run. Uh, but the main uh, thing to think about here is it's only trying to distribute the number of chunks. And the underlying assumption that is being made here by the auto balancer is that um, the number of, or sorry, the, the chunks that you have in your collection are similarly sized. Um, because if they're not similarly sized, then you know distributing the number of chunks evenly across the shards is going to have no relation to whether or not your data and your load are balanced <clears throat> um, one thing to think about here uh, to help the auto balancer is um, uh, setting the chunk size so this is a cluster-wide uh, setting uh, that you that you make uh, in all of your mongodb clusters that are sharded um, basically mongo will auto split uh, your chunks to ensure that they are below the size of the chunk size that you've uh, set. And so things to think about when determining how to set this configuration is um, setting it larger means that there will be fewer number of chunks, which means there will be less load and less data inside the config servers and also in memory and the Mongo S. However, you give up um, uh, granular balancing by doing this uh, because the the range in which a chunk can be um, is now greater. Uh, and also when Mongo does decide to move one chunk from a shard to another, uh, it will take longer and um, it's not totally transparent because it needs to copy and delete data from uh, both of the shards that are uh, affected by the chunk move. Uh, and so may have a longer impact of performance on your cluster when that's happening. <clears throat> so. How do we ensure that um, the auto balancer continues to actually do its job? So we have to then also ensure that the chunks are evenly sized. Um, there are some cases where auto splitting may not always work or may not work at all. Um, and those are if you know you have to restart your Mongo S uh, very frequently. Um, it 
it's the tier or it's the the component that actually decides when to split the chunks and if you restart them a lot they kind of lose count of uh, when it should split and so sometimes splitting may not happen um, and also if you have a huge number of mongo s's like many more than like five let's say um, then uh, auto splitting will happen very infrequently uh, and we found that to be the case at foursquare um, and you know, if we were all together in a room and I could see all of you, I would ask um, how many of you have actually, you know, gone through your clusters and looked at every single chunk in your clusters and, and looked at how big they were compared to everything else and see if they the they are actually evenly sized. Um, but since I can't see any of you, um, I'm just going to wager that probably not too many of you have done so. Um, and if you have, uh, feel free to let me know in the chat. Um, but I actually did that uh, as one of the first things um, to look at when we were trying to figure out why our clusters were having, um, you know, random queuing on some shards or some shards were just slower than others to return queries. Um, sometimes they just timed out and sometimes they, they you know, various uh, machines just died under the load. Uh, so this is one of the first things I looked at to, to look at what was going on under the hood. And I found out that uh, lo and behold, our chunks were very much not evenly sized. And so um, what I ended up doing was um, looking at these admin commands that Mongo provides you called split chunk and merge chunk, uh, which is are exactly what they sound like. Um, split chunk will cut a chunk in half based on the shard key range and merge chunk will merge a contiguous um, shard key range uh, of chunks together. Um, so like I mentioned, the, the chunk size setting causes Mongo to try and auto split to ensure that chunks are below uh, a certain size, but there is no auto merging functionality. So like I mentioned before, if you're in that situation where you've leave, left behind a bunch of empty chunks, or if for ever, whatever reason, the um, uh, access patterns in your collection cause uh, chunks to become smaller over time, uh, then uh, you're going to need some way to merge them back together to ensure that they're uh, similarly sized as everything else. And so what I ended up doing was creating um, an, a system that actually continuously crawled through all of the chunks and looked at a certain size. And then I set um, it, my own chunk size setting uh, in a different um, durable store. And that was actually on a per collection basis instead of a per cluster basis. Uh, and if you know it saw that chunks were much larger than they should be or much smaller than they should be, then it either split or merged them back together to ensure that everything was about evenly sized. And then the balancer could actually do its job. Um, and this was very effective actually. Um, and the reason why uh, I, I decided to set um, the chunk size per collection was that our, our collections have very different load. Uh, and so um, various collections have very, a different size of average documents or even different collection size. And so these things all impacted um, what, what I thought the, the chunk size should be. Okay, that's uh, enough talk about balancing. Um, this, this section, um, I'll preface with a caveat that it's not um, how to index, that could be its own talk uh, in itself, but merely just some um, observations and tips um, that I've seen uh, around indexing and how they relate to actually scaling out the cluster. Um, so first of all, what is indexing in MongoDB? Um, basically all queries in MongoDB uh, will scan every single document in the collection unless there's an index that exists to help that query um, not do that. And so there's um, multiple types of indexes in MongoDB, like a, a single field index, or you can have a compound index on multiple fields or multi keys to help index things that are in arrays uh, inside of a field. Um, there's even special kind of indexes like text and geospatial, but I won't really talk about um, you know, all of those here. Just know that those exist and you can use them for various uh, query patterns that you have. Um, some things to, to caution when thinking about indexes, like the, you know, based on what I had just said, uh, you might feel the need to, you know, just index everything um, to ensure that your queries run fast. And um, that might actually uh, cause the opposite to happen um, because Mongo requires that, you know, all of the um, uh, working set, which includes both the actual data of the documents and also the indexes that are associated uh, fit inside memory. 
And so, um, you know, adding a million indexes into your collections or uh, into your clusters um, may cause the working sets to fall out of memory. So indexes not only require additional storage on disk, but also memory. Um, and uh, it will have an adverse impact on um, your write performance because every update and insert um, has to look at which indexes are also affected by the fields that are being updated and inserted. Uh, and those indexes have to be updated. Uh, for the right to happen. <clears throat> so a couple of just kind of random tips um, in no particular order. Um, I would say uh, use partial indexes when you can. Um, partial indexes basically use um, a filter on a set of uh, fields and only index documents that uh, match that filter. Uh, and this is a superset of the um, functionality of a sparse index, uh, which a sparse index is basically only indexes uh, if that um, field exists in document. And if it doesn't exist, then it does not uh, index that document. And so you can also gain that functionality by using partial indexes. And this causes you know, less um, uh, load on your, <clears throat> on your cluster because there's fewer things inside the index. It also re uh, result in uh, less data stored on disk. Um, one kind of neat trick that we kind of found uh, with TTL index collections is um, often uh, it is the case that we need to set the TTL to some integer day, like seven days uh, or 30 days or something like that. Uh, and because our load was kind of fluctuating, you know, predictably from day to day, there was a, a typical trough period during the day and a typical peak period during the day. Um, we found that if you, instead of using like a, a, an integer value for your TTL time, um, offset it by half a day. So if you wanted to do a week, use seven and a half days instead. And what this will do is um, during the peak time, uh, most inserts are happening during that time. But if you set it off by half a day, that means um, the trough uh, time of deletes that happened you know, seven and a half days ago will be happening at the same time instead of the peak number of deletes uh, for those in uh, for those inserted um, seven days ago uh, to be happening at the same time. So you kind of offset the delete load versus the insert load there. Um, uh, I mentioned this kind of earlier, but choosing a useful shard key index will help you reduce the need to incur the cost of another uh, index for your shard key. So you know if you can if you know ahead of time that uh, you're going to be querying this collection uh, with the particular filter. Um, you, if you can use that uh, filter as the shard key, um, that would be an extra bonus. Uh, lastly, um, when uh, creating new indexes on an existing, like heavily loaded and high QPS cluster, um, you'll want to use a rolling index build, which is basically taking um, the, a single secondary out of every single shard uh, offline and starting it up as a standalone on a different port and building the index uh, there. And then once it's done, uh, allow it, uh, shut it down and allow it to rejoin um, its shard and then roll through all of the secondaries there. And then once you're done with all the secondaries, step down the primary and um, do the same thing to that. Um, this functionality actually exists if you're on a paid, plus, uh, paid tier of MongoDB Atlas. Um, there's like an option to just set that and it'll do it automatically for you. So definitely recommend doing that. Um, last thing, a couple of kind of common problems that I've seen, probably everybody can relate to the first one, uh, is when um, an application uh, ships a new feature that includes a new query pattern uh, and there's no index that exists on your cluster to, to fit that query pattern, then all of those new uh, queries will result in a collection scan that very quickly can just bring down your database. Um, some things to, to try and avoid that, uh, we, we included like a feature rollout checklist that includes um, looking for new query patterns and determining whether or not uh, we needed to add an index to fit, fit those new query patterns. Uh, and also just live monitoring of um, slow queries. So you can either do that by looking at the slow query log, uh, which by default will show you all the queries that take over 100 milliseconds uh, on your MongoDB clusters. Um, we also uh, in real time exported stack traces and drew graphs um, from all of our app servers, uh, which included 
you know, Mongo stack traces to, to very quickly see if we, you know, shipped a new, um, a, a new change that, that caused something like this. Uh, and we can very quickly roll back. Um, and the thing that helps a lot there is to use the dollar sign comment query operator uh, when you issue the query. So you can write this in your code. Um, and what we did was um, in the comment, we would say uh, the name of the service that issued the query and also which part of the code, uh, like which function in the code issued the query. So then when you look at the logs, um, you can very quickly figure out what, uh, what the culprit is. The second thing, um, this is uh, a much more devious failure mode um, is that you may have a query that has been performing just fine, um, but over time, uh, your data has changed in such a way that um, Mongo stops using the correct index. Uh, and this can happen if um, you have you know, multiple compound indexes or multiple indexes on your collection, but none of those 100% match the shape of the query. And, but you know, the one that it has been using for a long time was good enough. Uh, but over time, Mongo decides to switch to the other uh, less optimal index, and that could cause an outage or degraded performance as well. Um, that's because the query planner uh, doesn't actually run the plans to completion. It only looks at the first, uh, the plan that returns the first 101 documents the quickest, and it chooses that one. And so perhaps over time, the shape of your data uh, has changed in such a way that um, the the suboptimal index actually returns the first 101 documents quicker, but is much slower on the rest of the query. Um, and so to avoid this, um, the uh, correct thing to do would be to add the index that perfectly fits the shape of the query. But if you cannot do that for cost or other reasons, then um, you can add a hint to your queries uh, to force it back to using the, the better index. Uh, the downside to that is if you do end up um, adding that perfect index later down the line, uh, you have to remember to change uh, your hint um, or just get rid of it. Otherwise, uh, Mongo will not, not actually use it. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit to talk about uh, the, last, um, the last topic, which is performance isolation. Uh, we actually at Foursquare um, used all of the strategies that I'm about to talk about here uh, for various reasons. Um, basically, what this is, is to uh, try and offload some specific uh, loads from your uh, main production database. And uh, that's because um, if you do so, it will allow your clusters to scale much more easily. But there can also be other reasons, like if um, there's some access patterns or some features that, that require some queries that um, you cannot actually run on your production cluster without causing performance degradations or things like that. Um, you may need to do this as well. So it may enable you to, to run workloads that are not possible to run uh, in your production Mongo cluster. <clears throat> so some of the strategies would be to, you know, um, if you just want to stick with Mongo, separate your clusters by a service or by function. And we did this as well. So we had you know, a separate cluster for our users data, a separate cluster for our check-ins data, a separate cluster for our venues data. And we had many, many uh, different clusters uh, that we've created over time. Um, some nice things about this is that uh, you, you gain more predictable performance for each one of these clusters because the amount of query patterns is reduced. Uh, so you can optimize for those um, smaller set of, of query patterns in a particular cluster. So our clusters were configured very differently based on um, what data was in there and, and how they were being accessed. Um, you also um, gain kind of uh, uh, incident isolation. So if one of these clusters became degraded or went offline, um, not every one of our services were also offline because of that. So you kind of minimize the blast radius by doing that. Uh, and it's still much easier to, to operate and maintain because you're still just using Mongo. Uh, some other things that we, we did um, was to replicate MongoDB data off to a different um, database, uh, such as Redis or Elasticsearch. Um, and the reasons to do that are um, might, or might be that you need joins or you wanted to index across a different dimension. Say you want to build an inverted index on, on a particular collection. 
um, you could do that by basically tailing the, the op log in your MongoDB cluster or using the new change streams functionality uh, to look at all of the change, changes, uh, updates, inserts, deletes that are coming into your um, database and uh, replicate all of those changes into a diff different store. <clears throat> um, the last thing is uh, you may need to do analytical or machine learning uh, types of queries that, that necessarily have to scan all of the data in your collections. Um, and so uh, you could do that by doing the same replication, but to a system like Hadoop or HDFS um, or like a data warehouse uh, to run those types of workloads without impacting your online DB. <clears throat> uh, but uh, doing this, you kind of incur a lot of extra overhead. Um, you know, if you use other systems, it adds complexity. You have to then staff uh, people who know how to operate those systems, um, and you have to staff the people who know how to build the the pipelines and to update the pipelines. Um, one of the hardest things uh, about doing this is to ensure that what you're replicating is actually correct. You're not dropping anything on the floor. Uh, when you do, how do you recover from that uh, and ensure that you know all of the data in your secondary systems are all correct? Um, that was one of the most expensive and costly parts of doing this. Um, and also, if your you know app needs new features or you know other teams need to query your data differently, uh, you have to build new pipelines, and that's slow. And ensure all of these. Um, additional monitoring and, and correctness uh, guarantees are also built into the into that as well. So uh, if you don't want to deal with those things that I just talked about, um, there is an, another option, which is maybe why you're here for this talk, um, which is uh, using Rockset to do this external indexing. And so here I'll hand it off back to Prakash to talk about this. Um, we may need to take a short pause while I you know hand over control of this presentation over to him. Sorry, I was on mute. Thanks, Dai. So yeah, um, so Dai talked about a lot of these offloading strategies uh, to various different systems and what are the complexities around that. So I will go over what um, external indexing is and how uh, your, a lot of companies are doing it today. What are some of the challenges and what benefits uh, Rockset brings? So first, um, let's start with your primary application. So when you start building your uh, app, so you have like a primary app, which could be a gaming app or it could be a uh, e-commerce website, whatever it is. So you have a primary app, you have like a web services or microservices layer, and then you're reading and writing from MongoDB. But there are a lot of cases where you need to build features or applications that needs to react to uh, the primary events. So, and that's where external indexing is very powerful because you get full performance isolation. You're not uh, loading your primary database, but at the same time, you can build these engaging features. So what are some of those features? Um, fraud detection is a very common one where like there is a primary uh, transaction that gets updated in your MongoDB, and then you want to quickly run through that transaction with a offline model that you have built and figure out if that transaction is fraudulent or it could be a leaderboard app this is a very common feature built in gaming uh, where there are multiple players playing and as they get more points there is a common leaderboard application that needs to reflect and refresh this data and uh, personalization is another area where if you have an e-commerce website or if you are uh, have a, a movie streaming website where you want to personalize all the content based on user behavior. So today, typically you uh, do the model uh, building offline and then you do all the predictions also offline and then push it to a key value store like Cassandra or other stores and then serve out of that. But the problem with that is you are not using the user's current uh, activities is to, for the recommendation. So this means like sometimes you're not uh, fully monetizing all the possibilities that you can do f uh, of the user's activities. And uh, there are more apps like search is another common one uh, 
IoT is another one where you have data coming from different devices and then you need to just plug in a dashboard or it could be running more sophisticated anomaly detection on top of these uh, data that is coming from these different devices to predict failures or even to react to failures quickly. So we created Rockset for developers to easily build such engaging data-driven applications from your primary database. So before going into the details of how it is done with Rockset and what are the benefits of Rockset, let me just quick give a quick overview of how the stack looks like today. So on the left, you have your primary app, and then there is a web services, there is MongoDB, there is also a cache layer or sometimes. And then when you need more of these features or internal applications to be built off of your primary database, typically you offload them to RDBMS sometimes, like Postgres if you need some uh, analytic capabilities, or it could be for Elasticsearch if you need some search capabilities. So one problem with uh, uh, this approach is um, newer apps and newer features require spinning a lot of secondary storages and uh, of course along with it different microservices. So it's, it increases complexity and cost. Some organizations are very good in handling this and they have uh, a good control of how many secondary storages are spun up. Some of them have way too many secondary storages. Sometimes that uh, that creates a lot of different uh, silos, even for our uh, app development. And the way it manifests is when a particular feature needs data from different uh, data storage, so typically the microservices layer has to talk to all of them. So which means now you have uh, lot of interaction between these microservices going on so for example a leaderboard app if it needs data from Elasticsearch and MongoDB and some Postgres it needs to talk to four or five services to gather all the data and then combine them and then serve back so the blast radius is now really high now we have to think about fallback strategies so this can get quickly uh, complicated as the number of microservices that you deploy increases so how uh, you can build data-driven applications with Rockset and Mongo is on the left, you have your primary app and you have data being written and read from, uh, from Mongo. For all the reactive applications for these data-driven applications, we have built a, a native integration with Mongo. So all change streams, every record that is being updated will automatically be synced to Rockset and we persist that data and then we automatically shred that data into different indexes. Some of them are inverted index, row index, columnar index, and then you can uh, use different APIs to query them. So the, the popular one is, of course, you can use SQL to query any kind of, uh, 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 like uh, express any kind of queries. So SQL is so powerful that you can do search, that you can do lookups, and you can also do more columnar or uh, like uh, uh, range range queries so uh, so we support full sql api that and we automatically choose the indexes for you so that you don't need to worry about which index to use when so you can automatically like uh, you can just write your queries and we are we choose which uh, index to use for that query to return the results in subsequent latency and what this allows you to do is build more powerful apis on top of your data in your uh, in in MongoDB, so you can, if you want to build like top end uh, API, or if you want to build a recommendations API or an anomalies API, so you can easily uh, uh, build those APIs or those microservices on top of Rockset for these read heavy applications. So what are the benefits here? So the first one is it's efficient scaling, so you get full performance isolation. Uh, there is not too many secondary indexes on MongoDB, so which is very, which is great. All of those uh, like secondary indexes doesn't burden your primary app. And the second one is your you can reduce complexity. You can eliminate spinning up too many different secondary storages uh, thanks to the converged indexing. So since we index uh, the data in multiple ways, like inverted index, row index, and columnar index. You can, uh, you can avoid spinning up those uh, extra storages that is needed. And uh, the nice part is the integration that we have with Mongo 
is real time. So any update that haps, uh, happens in Mongo, the records are immediately synced within uh, a gap of one or two seconds into Rockset. And it is fully managed as well. So which means you don't need to worry about uh, any of the like uh, um, uh, server, managing the servers or the pipeline correctness, all of that is completely taken care of by Rockset. And during this uh, replication, you can also provide some field mappings, like if you want to drop some fields, for example, your MongoDB collections had 200 fields, and if you want to only index 50 fields, you can only specify what fields you want, and also specify some transformations if you want on, during, the, during this uh, replication process. And the other thing is, like Mongo, you can also bring in data from other data sources. So this could be event data in Kafka or Kinesis, or you could have partners uploading data in S3, or it could be other transactional databases like MySQL, Postgres, or even NoSQL databases like Dynamo. So what this allows you to do is um, actually combine data from various different sources and serve those results in uh, real time. So there could be cases like uh, for personalization, for example, um, in order to do live predictions, typically you need to build a feature for that particular user. And this feature information could be uh, in different places. It could be in Mongo, it could be in MySQL, it could be in Dynamo. So uh, typically it's hard to do this in real time, in live, when a request comes. So normally companies, the way they build it is offline and then do the pre-compute of all of these predictions and then push it to a key value store. But now, since you can sync data from multiple sources real time, you can easily serve these requests in real time, uh, do the uh, predictions also live. And the primary enabler here is the SQL API. So as you bring in data from these different uh, data sources, you want to normally join this data across these different data sources. The full-fledged SQL API allows you to like combine this data uh, from the different sources. And another nice uh, thing about Rockset is as you bring in this data from different sources, you don't need to worry about uh, data modeling, um, especially around schema migration. There is no star schemas or anything needed. So you can just have uh, like JSON documents uh, ingested from Mongo. At the same time, you can also bring in more structured data from MySQL or more even data which are more semi-structured you know, from Kafka. So you can work with these different data models and we automatically build smart schemas based off of the data so that you can work with these semi-structured data very efficiently. And the last thing is what this allows uh, you is to build more lightweight isolated microservices so in the previous model that I showed, you have a microservices which is talking to like 10 other microservices and the blast radius is really high uh, when it comes to like any uh, failures. So with this approach, you have microservices which are more isolated, so which means there is less operational fires and each uh, API that you build with Rockset is basically hits a particular REST API endpoint. So which means they are like uh, in, by in itself a microservice so there is no too much uh, services interacting with each other. So you can, um, you can isolate these microservices better. So finally, what are the benefits of building up applications? First and foremost, you're reducing your infrastructure complexity and spend as you scale. So you're not just spinning up a lot of secondary storages, a lot of cash, a lot of services, and uh, uh, worrying about correctness of replicating to all of them and and uh, uh, like increasing the spend there. And the second one is you're you are able to build more powerful data APIs on data in MongoDB for your application. So this, this allows you to uh, like uh, build more engaging features which you were not able to build before. And the third one is also you can combine data from these other sources, so which is commonly useful for uh, applications like personalization or even fraud detection where you need to do live predictions. And the last one is you're reducing the load on MongoDB here and you're able to scale your read uh, like read heavy applications better and overall like web services stack better. 
So we also have a cool swag uh, going on. So uh, if you sign up for Rockset this week, and if you get a, uh, like if you have an integration going with Mongo, we can, uh, like we are offering a free t-shirt. So uh, this is all for US users. So we can ship it uh, as soon as you uh, get started with uh, Rockset in the next week. So with that, we will take uh, questions. So I have a bunch of questions uh, here. So you can also join the community Slack channel and ask there. First, we'll take a few questions on uh, Mongo and Rockset. Uh, so I have a bunch of questions here. So the first one probably for Dai, how do I find the problematic queries that are affecting MongoDB? Yeah, um, so a couple things that I had mentioned, one was the slow query log. So MongoDB um, by default will log all queries uh, that take longer than 100 milliseconds. So you can look through this log to see um, which queries are, are considered slow. Um, you can change this uh, 100 millisecond setting uh, to something else if you uh, if slow means something else to you uh, and your particular workload. Um, so it, it can filter out uh, a different set of queries there for you. Um, and another tool that Mongo provides is called Mongo Top. Uh, it's just like a binary that you can run. Um, you connect it to a particular cluster uh, and it will spit out um, the amount of time it's spent uh, working on reads and writes uh, for a particular collection. So it will not tell you the exact query that was run, but you may be able to identify inside of a cluster that has many collections, um, which collection uh, is taking up the most resources there. Got it. Cool. That's pretty cool. I have one more. Uh, this is also around uh, Mongo's uh, Query. So, how can I determine which queries are consuming the most resources on my MongoDB cluster? Yep, exactly what I, I think I, I just said. Um, uh, those two tools um, that I mentioned. You can also. Um, th this is a bit more time consuming, but you can also um, kind of turn on the profiler, uh, query profiler, and that will spit out much more detailed information about um, the resources that are being consumed uh, by the part, any particular queries that are running on your cluster. Um, if you've pinpointed it down to a set of, uh, you know, handful of queries that you are suspecting, you can actually run and explain on each one of those queries and look at, uh, you know, how many documents are being scanned, um, if it's actually using the correct indexes and things like that. Okay. Uh, cool. Cool. Uh, there's one more on Mongo. With MongoDB, who controls the auto splitting and auto merging? Is there a separate node spun up for it? And what uh, is the so, impact? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the the component that controls the auto splitting of chunks is the Mongo S. So it it keeps a, a running tally inside of itself in memory of all of the updates and inserts that have gone to particular chunks. Uh, and it compares that to some uh, coefficient uh, multiplied against the uh, configured chunk size. And if it goes goes over that, then it will decide to split it. Uh, if not, then it will not decide to split it. So like I mentioned before, if you restart this um, tier a lot uh, is when you may run into a situation where auto splitting doesn't happen. Or if you have a lot of these uh, Mongo S's, it may also happen very infrequently or not enough or not at all, um, because each one of these can only see the amount of traffic that's going through itself, right? So if you have 100 of these, each one can only see 1% of the traffic, uh, the overall traffic. So it may not be doing the right thing there. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's not another node that's spun up. Um, nothing else is controlling it. So yeah, it's just the Mongo S that determines this. And then for auto merging, um, there is no such functionality. Uh, Mongo will never merge your chunks back together uh, by itself. So you have to do that on your own. Cool, cool. There is one question on uh, Rockset. So how can I build indexes in Rockset? Uh, so I can take this. So in Rockset, uh, you you can build, uh, like uh, as you ingest data uh, from MongoDB or from other data sources, we automatically shred all of this data like and index 
uh, build these different indexes, the inverted index, the row index, and the columnar index that I talked about for e all the fields. So you don't need to worry about what index to build and how to leverage that index for your queries. So that's completely fully managed behind the scenes. So uh, you can, uh, yeah, you can just ingest and uh, run your queries and uh, do your performance uh, uh, based on your performance requirements. You can choose the different uh, instance sizes. So we have different virtual instance sizes, and you can choose which ones uh, you can use, uh, which ones would suit your query performance needs best. Cool. I think uh, uh, there are a few more questions, but I, I recommend again, like since we're almost on the time here, I recommend joining the Slack channel, uh, bit.ly slash rockset hyphen community hyphen channel, and we can continue some of the Q&A there. Um, Dai and I will be there and there'll be more people from Rockset, so to answer your questions. And um, uh, last thing, there is also uh, a Twitch stream next week, July 7th at 11 a.m. Pacific time. The stream will be about building your first MongoDB Rockset integration. So if you liked what you saw about the MongoDB Rockset integration that I talked about, uh, you can see a, a demo of the integration and how it uh, how it will enable you or how it, you can get started. So you make sure you follow us on Twitter at Rockset Cloud to get these updates and what we are doing and what events we will be hosting. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone.